So I, I'd like to, uh, before we open up for, for questions, uh, let's, let's walk people through what the program looks like. Sure. Uh, it's and, and again, all of that is in detail in the book, um, which again, I, I commend to you, but just uh, what's it feel like? How's it, how do you start it? Yeah, yeah so it's the, the rule number one is the most important rule. It's what you don't eat that's important. And if you remember that, we'll be okay. Hmm. Uh, number two rule is you are what you eat, but we've forgotten that you are what the thing you're eating ate. And so for instance, if a cow is fed corn and beans, that cow is basically an ear of corn with uh, meat on it. Uh, a chicken that's fed corn is no longer a chicken. It's an ear of corn with feathers. And it's amazing the number of people that I've seen that it was the organic free range chicken that was the cause of their lupus. And when we took their organic free range chicken away from them, uh, their lupus went away. Yeah. So let's, let's <laughs> drill down because that was a, a fascinating insight to me. At the end of the day, when you're eating uh, pasture raised beef or free range chicken, that doesn't guarantee you anything. Correct, because the federal government allowed the law to be changed that, an organ that a free range chicken can be kept in a warehouse its entire life, fed corn and grains and soybeans, and never has to be let outside. And as long as you open a door to the outside for five minutes every 24 hours. That's I, I, the I, law. I, I mean, it's like, it's such a crazy bullshit that it drives me nuts, right? So in other words, the, the chicken has the potential option of going out That's and right. being free in, in a range. For five minutes. For five minutes. <laughs> so, um, and of course, it's crammed in there with 10, 000, uh, 100,000 other chickens and it can't get to the door. Yeah. So what kind of chicken and beef do you need to be eating? What's the defined class that actually meets the, the standards that you so, support? Yeah, so find a farmer that pasture raises their chicken. And I go to a farmer's market and say, what do you feed your chickens? And the answer is nothing. Uh, they're insectivores. They work for me. They go out and eat bugs. They eat, you know, grass. But they're bug eaters. And so they really, all they actually need is a little scratch, which is, uh, uh, not corn, uh, actually little pieces of pebbles to grind in their gizzard. Mm -hmm. But that's what chickens are supposed to eat. Now, you've got to be careful with pasture or grass-fed beef because the law got changed because every cow spends a few days, at least, on grass. So you can actually legitimately call a, something in your supermarket grass-fed beef even if, if it spent a minimum amount of time eating grass because it was grass-fed at some time in its life. Right. So you've got to find grass-fed and grass-finished. Yeah. Now... I've stopped eating beef and pork and lamb for reasons you'll see in the book, and it's, it's pretty wild, and we won't go into that today. But wild fish, wild shellfish, pastured chicken are perfectly safe. But one of the things that I get into in the book, and I, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, and we have made protein the almighty god of nutrition. And one of the things that makes longevity happen in the blue zones, those are the people with the longest lives, they have impressive animal protein restriction. Animal protein is a minimal part of their diet. And I, I think that's actually one of the real keys if we want to have profound longevity. And we can talk about more about that. Yeah. And it hurts me to say that because I grew up in Omaha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, and it's interesting, right? Uh, uh, we both know of, of uh, individuals who go on uh, caloric restriction diets to lengthen their lives. And uh, when you're only getting you know, 1,200 calories versus 3,000, every calorie you take in is something like you like, <laughs> I want that calorie. You can become very specific about what calories you take in. And, uh, and you've, you taught me something about uh, what they've been doing that's absolutely wrong. Yeah. it's. Uh the St. Louis University has a, a long, uh, ongoing study of the Calorie Restriction Society, and 
like Peter says, these are folks who really restrict their calories uh, about 35% of normal. And they're very thin and they're very cold, <laughs> uh, but they, they don't uh, age rapidly, but they have a, uh, there's a insulin-like growth factor that I measure in all my patients every three months. And it's a, it's a very good marker of how fast or slow we're aging. And it, it's a pretty good stand-in for whether mTOR is activated or is quiescent. So they've studied these calorie restriction folks, and they've been fascinated that they really, their insulin-like growth factors, which should be incredibly low, are really just about normal of everybody else. And so they also study uh, vegans. And so they asked, and vegans carry very low insulin-like growth factors. Um, so they asked some of the calorie restriction society folks to eat vegan, but keep their calories restricted, but eliminate animal protein. Right. And like you say, these guys love every last calorie. And so they tend to eat a lot of their calories as, as animal protein, because if you're not gonna get much, you might as well enjoy it. Yep. So when they did that, then their insulin-like growth factors plummeted, even below what the vegans were doing. And so that study, and also a couple of studies in long-term rhesus monkeys, which also implicates that it's the protein load that really makes the long-term difference uh, in longevity. Mm -hmm. And again, it just it breaks my heart, but I think it's true. <laughs> um, you take supplements. Yes, I do. Uh, I do as well. Uh, my dear friend Ray Kurzweil does uh, too. <laughs> uh, his wife says Ray has a superpower, his ability to swallow handfuls of pills and one, one drink. Um, what are the key most important supplements that, that you recommend to people right now? So and, we, and by the way, you have all this information on your Gundry MD website as well. Right. Yeah. Uh, as you know, I used to think supplements made expensive urine. I really did. Um, the, the, the pleasure my patients have given to me, and I dedicated this book to my patients who really have taught me everything I know or made me find out everything I know, mm -hmm. is that we can look at people taking a supplement or not taking a supplement, and we can see biomarkers that are measurable and that get improved, and then we can take that supplement away or they'll forget to take it, and we can see that that biomarker uh, gets worse. So one of the things we should all be taking is huge amounts of polyphenols. Right. Now, again, we're designed to interact with plant compounds, um, particularly compounds in dark uh, berries, where actually should have a lot of the polyphenols in coffee. Chocolate has a fantastic polyphenol, green tea. Uh, so the, the polyphenols are primarily in the um, coating of the seeds or in the peel of the seeds and also the seed itself. But unfortunately, most of our fruit now has been bred for sugar content. Mm -hmm. So most of our modern fruit is, is candy, unfortunately. Yeah. And by the way, you recommend uh, not eating uh, fruits throughout the year, maybe somewhat during the summer. Right. But uh, I've eliminated, you know, 95 percent of the fruit in my diet. I'll still eat a few blackberries and blueberries. But that's about it. Yeah. Uh, years ago, uh, in June, in the Santa Barbara Farmer's Market, I was putting some peaches in a bag. And my wife says, hey, aren't you the guy that says don't eat fruit? And I said, yeah, yeah, but it's summer now. You know, <laughs> we can eat fruit. And she said, I'll tell you, smart guy, why don't we give up fruit this summer and let's see what happens? And I said, oh, come on. It's, you know, <laughs> come on. And she said, no, let's do it. So we both gave up fruit. Uh, I lost eight pounds that summer. We didn't change anything else, and she lost six pounds. Yeah, it, it really is. I mean, it is, it we, is sugar. Yeah, we use fruit to fatten up for the winter. All great apes only gain weight during fruit season. Yeah. They only gain weight during fruit season. Just as a reminder, please uh, uh, post your, your questions for Dr. Guntry. We're going to go to Q&A in just a minute from my, my colleague here, Marissa. Um, so so yeah. polyphenols are yeah. great. The other thing we don't other supplements, right? Yeah, the other thing we don't get is a lot of plant-based compounds, green compounds, which are phytochemicals. Our our ancestors, even actually the the Kalahari Bushmen, have been studied, and they eat 
250 different plant species on a rotating basis throughout the year. And they interact with all those phytochemicals, and those phytochemicals change their bacteria genome, and those phytochemicals communicate to our genome. If we really think eating an organic diet and visiting the farmer's market, we can interact with 250 different plant species. You know, I got open oceanfront property in Palm Springs to sell you. Uh, <laughs> it, it can't be done. So we've got to get those back in our diet. And the third thing that people have to get back in their diet is what are called prebiotics. Now, most people have heard of probiotics. Sure. Those are the bacteria. But the bacteria have to have something to eat. And these guys thrive on uh, complex starches, fructo-oligosaccharides, oligosaccharides, that they eat and reproduce. And the cool thing is that these sorts of sugar molecules we can't digest. And the other cool thing is the obesogenic bacteria can't digest these complex sugar molecules. So what are some examples uh, there? So uh, one of the most famous ones is glucomonin or konjac root. Uh, there's a number of very good products on the market. I'll give a shout out to Miracle Noodles. Uh, Jonathan Karp, MD from the LA area makes Miracle Noodles. They're noodles or rice that are made out of the konjac root and bugs love this stuff. Inulin, which is a fructo-oligosaccharide, is also a great thing. You can use acacia powder, you can use psyllium. Psyllium husks are a fermentable fiber. Mm -hmm. In terms of vegetables, uh, Jerusalem artichokes, sometimes sunchokes, are fantastic. Taro root is wonderful. My wife and I had some taro root chips last night, as a matter of fact. Sweet potatoes are fine, um, just make but. sure. But they, they're there as a delivery device to get olive oil into your mouth. Yeah.